student. And then um, the Umaha Nation Tribal Council, the donation that we received was seven acres. Um, and then Big Out State Park, our um, park ranger, um, Mike Kindle, he's, he's been a big supporter of us. Um, and then UNL Tribal Extension Office, um, Ted Hibbler, he's always bringing consultants with the needs. We have a problem right. He's really been helpful and beneficial towards our um, success of addressing these problems. And then I can't, I can't say it, Comunidad Maya, the first year that we had the, um, uh, we planted the seven acres down there, we had the Mayan community came up and they taught us um, traditional, um, their traditional farming practices in taking care of the corn. Um, and then Dr. Ed Spivak, Brenda, is, that, is he the one that helped with the pollinator garden down there? Yes, he's the bee man, yeah. So he made a donation for our seven acres and they put in um, a, a pollinator garden down there. And then the Julian Grace Foundation, uh, they helped with the greenhouse, with the space, um, uh, and building uh, the Tuzingo Bogonza, revamping it from, from a little tiny church into a modern uh, upgrade. And then the Omaha Language and Culture Center, they always, uh, we always uh, vet our lessons through them to give us the, the appropriate pronunciation of the words and what we're teaching, the concept. Um, we have a, a tool here that we use, but they developed this um, Omaha Iebade that speak Omaha. So we use this in our lessons. We can go right to it to, um, uh, help us with um, concepts, and they develop this this uh, workbook through the Omaha Language and Culture Center. So, um, building curriculum is a, a big, big, a huge mountain for us as Native educators to climb. And I'm really thankful for the ones that do um, help with that aspect because you know we have. Um, we're we, we're meeting, trying to meet the demand of uh, the Western the, the education system in our state to meet the standards and all of these um, uh, benchmarks and, and things that they want us to teach the students. But we have to start from scratch. And I'm so thankful for our elders and our language people that we have. And then also, our, um, we received a grant from the Healthy Schools Institute of Nebraska. Um, uh, this is going to be our second year that we've been collaborating with them. Um, they came to our school and they seen what we were doing, going out, taking them outside, and they said, "You know what? You guys are following our whole our whole child's model. Here's four thousand dollars." <laughs> and so we we utilize that to um, uh, use our our garden tools and our supplies and stuff, and we're so thankful for that. And then another one is the Farm to School of Nebraska. Um, we've been working with them. Sarah Smith is a really great lady. Um, I presented with her a couple times now. Um, and getting that food into our schools, that healthy food that's grown here locally. And, um, and then the last one is I Love Public Schools. They came to our school a few years ago and they did a documentary on our outdoor classroom. Do you want to show that? Oh, I, I need to share my screen. Can I share my screen on the bottom? And so do I go, I go here? No? Oh, here, yes. oh, yes. Okay, so. Uh, oh, here. So this is, um, it's called Harvesting Hope. And they came, uh, and it was like a couple months, maybe, or so. Um, they did um, different areas. I don't know if I can play the video if it, we have enough time, but these are um, some of the pictures that they took. This is on their website, and if you guys want, I can share that in the chat box, the link to that. Um, 
and it's uh, from planting to harvesting and everything in between Umaha Nation Public School students connect with their community and receive hands-on experience in agriculture, economics, and cultural traditions. And here's a quote by Brenda. Wherever you go, there's always going to be something exciting that we don't know anything about. When you are outside, there's so much to learn. So one of our main goals of this outdoor classroom is for students to connect to their native culture in new ways. And we work to re-traditionalize students by introducing them to crops historically indigenous to the Imaha people. And you see here um, some of the vegetables that we've harvested and we're talking about them and learning about them in the classroom. And one of the things uh, that we teach about in our food sovereignty is how much has been lost. So when our students are sitting in the classroom, each new class that we have come in, I ask them, how many in here have ever eaten buffalo? And it's just usually me and Miss Murphy raise our hands, maybe one or two, but that shows that gives them the measure of the law of how the traditional food that kept us happy and healthy are now gone. They're not accessible to us anymore. How do we make them accessible? Well, we have to do it ourselves. We have to take that initiative. And I, I don't know, I'm just, I think I was raised that way just to get out there and do it. <laughs> so that's what we've done is, you know, take, and it's a lot of physical labor. Um, and then in the high school program, they, um, they do a farmer's market. They teach how to market these, um, their produce. Um, and then here's some more pictures of us, um, uh, the kids harvesting and bringing the food in and selling it at the farmer's market. Um, and these are the, the cucumber cages that we built for the cucumbers down there, processing the food and bringing it in. So that's uh, some of the things that we've done. Um, I know, uh, Brenda, I don't know if you have anything else you want to share. Uh, so here's, um, I just want to share one more. Um, this is from our website that we built during COVID and we had to do um, virtual classroom. Everybody remembers the nightmare. <laughs> we had to teach elementary kids from in the classroom and going into everybody's homes and but we developed this, um, it has our vision statement and our mission statement. And then it breaks down our curriculum framework, scope and sequence. Um, these are some of the things that we, uh, that we do. Uh, we do our plants, honorable harvesting. This is Dongazong, our gardening. We're entering it at a harvest time and fall planting. Our caretakers of the land is a um, beautiful way of saying we take up trash. We clean up our, we keep our area clean and beautiful. And we, um, we're going to teach us about the seasons and the weather, um, identifying the changes that are coming. And then, of course, of course, our greenhouse. And she teaches them about the equinox wisdom. Um, we learn about animals and insects. And then uh, we have a lesson that we um, teach about the, um, the water, the Oglala Aquifer. And then we take the kids on walks. Um, some days, uh, Miss Murphy and I will put in to at least three to five miles a day of walking with the kids. When it, the weather's good, we'll, we, we put in a lot of miles, <laughs> 10,000 steps. <laughs> um, and then like she said, we do environmental concerns. And it goes, it kind of, um, uh, and then the second nine weeks is our gassi day, the winter time. And it's the same thing because every season it, it implements into those same areas. Um, we do, um, we put our, our garden beds to sleep. Um, and then we are working with, right now we're working on a collaboration project with NASA to implement um, constellation and star story. Um, that's an ongoing collaboration. Our, our project partner, she got ill last year and, and she finally recovered her health, thank God. And we're gonna start our collaboration again. So hopefully we will we and I think a lot of people seen it on the news that we had our first indigenous person go into space. Um, the lady astronaut, 
I can't remember now. No, her last name was Nan. And I think that's so exciting. So that's I'm I'm really looking forward to that. And that just goes on. Um, we do uh, for our summer. I started last year. I did the elementary. The first year we only did the high school students, but this past summer we did the elementary for summer school. So they actually got to do their learning their garden skills earlier. And we set some goals that by the time they get to eighth grade and they go on to high school, that will be the last time that they work with us in eighth grade. That um, we've identified some goals that we want to meet some criteria in building our curriculum. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, Magonde. Yeah, just one last thing that um, resources currently in development are part of our strategic plan, our K through 12 curriculum materials and resources, teacher training courses. And those teacher training courses are part of a consideration to become a Nebraska Department of Education recognized endorsement in nature-based education. So I'm working on that too. So we've been talking about this and um, Brenda has been working on it. Um, we need to think about the future when we need to pass this course on to somebody else. Um, it is a physically intensive job, and you know we don't get younger; we get older. <laughs> we need collaborative partners to, um, and also to. Um, that's why we want to share this um, our program that we've been working on developing, so that it can be in all schools, and that our native students can participate in in across the board here in Nebraska. And I know we have a lot, uh, a long way to go. So I don't know if there's anything else. We only have a few minutes left if anybody wants to ask questions. Uh, I'm gonna stop my share, right? Should I stop the share? I'm gonna do that. Oh, no, that's not what I did. Oh, there it is, okay. All right. <laughs> I have a yeah. question. There you go. Okay. Um, over the summer, I got a chance to visit with you um, down in your school, and there was a young lady from Columbia there, and she had so much information about using the phases of the moon during gardening. And I remember, Dalberta, you were telling us about how you followed. Um, one of her her teachings um, mm -hmm. when it comes to pulling weeds there's certain times um, during the phases of the moon where you don't pull weeds otherwise they'll just come back stronger and other times where um, if you pull the weeds during that time they just disappear they don't come back um, yeah. and I remember that that young woman was going to share all their teachings about the phases of the moon in gardening and I was wondering if you were ever able to get a copy of that she's she's working on it she said she has it because it's in their language and she has to redesign it into english for us so yes absolutely we're still in contact with her um one of the things that um it reminded me of when she talked about was a long time ago when i was a little girl and some of you native people might have heard this before that they would cut their hair uh, just trim it in the full moon during the full moon. So we we also tried that. My uh, she said she tried she tried it to see if it was true. Um, so me, my daughter, and uh, one of my grandchildren, we cut our hair, just trimmed it on the back a little bit in August. My hair has grown almost two inches. <laughs> so it has it's, there's science behind it, and that's something that we're looking forward to learning more about. They had a, a similar teaching about um, harvesting though, where if you're gonna harvest from above ground, you wait until the full moon. And if you're gonna harvest from below ground, like the tubers and the roots, um, mm -hmm. then you wait until the new moon. But that, that was the only teaching I ever had with um, associating the phases of the moon. And you know, um, one of the things that uh, uh, the um, Aldrich, Lady, when she was talking about her the colonization 
and all of that, the process that we went through, we lost so much indigenous wisdom. We had all of that. And, uh, you know, it went away through colonization period. But through the hard work of persistent people, <laughs> we can reclaim that. You know, it's, it, it's going to come back to us. It's just, it just, it, it just needs, uh, it needs time. So I, as soon as we hear back from her, yes, absolutely, Mr. I'm, I, because I want to make sure it's in place for um, next year. Our, our, um, because I do not like weeds. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I'm looking forward to it. So as soon as she gets it to you, then it, I'd be happy if you would share it with us. Yeah. Um, one other thing I wanted to share, I was listening to um, Ms. Knoyer this morning when she was talking about language, um, that there wasn't a word for education. Well, my um, son, he was reading a book about this um, uh, Dakota man who was telling his story. And in Dakota, there's no word for weeds. Um, that's, a, that's a colonized word. Um, and I think a lot of language, because as Native people, Indigenous people, we knew all the purposes of these plants. And Brenda has so generously taught me what I thought was we need, that everything has a purpose. And we just need to rediscover that. And I only know like this much compared to you. So I'm looking forward to learning more from you, Michelle. I, um, Brenda, I, um, everybody before we go, I wanted to share these with you. Brenda, you want to talk about these a little bit? This is called Humble Bumble Sab. You see that right here? Yeah, it's and just we it's just a simple sab. Um, usually in the classroom, we just put a Band-Aid on whatever. And but some of these kids- from, Brenda? Oh, Where did what? you get this from? Where did you get the plant from to make that? Um, outside. In come free get them from the garden come free arrow um i had some calendula stored at home um you know just it's a really simple healing salve and when kids come in and they have a, something on the back of their ankle or whatever i just put a thin layer on the band-aid because it keeps it from sticking but it also helps it heal <laughs> so we these help put I'm very humble about this, but she helped put a lot of indigenous plants into our medicine garden. And she harvested over nine different medicines out of our garden and made salve from them this year. And, she and I take she also, um, she's created a catalog that goes along with all of these um, plants and the medicinal use, the name for them. The only thing that's lacking in there, and I know she's working on it, is the umaha name for all of these plants. Yeah, and I, I've also, um, there's been a couple of girls that are going through rough times, and I've taken them one-on-one -on -one out when I'm harvesting, and I've taught them the process for harvesting, um, because it's, it's, it's a nice soothing time when you're just connecting with a plant and you're offering it a gift in exchange for its medicine. And, you know, it's a nice way to connect. And it's been a help for both of those girls to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one time. And one thing I noticed that um, when working with plants, jobs that people, grown-ups would think are mundane and, um, kind of a bother the kids actually get like satisfaction from it they'll they'll calmly clean a plant off and um, clean little twigs and stuff out of the tiniest little little pieces of um, herbs and they do it does have a calming effect on them and understanding that bees have their place and bugs have their places so so I see we only have one minute left, Amy. I just wanted to take that time to thank everybody. And thank you, Amy, for putting this together for us. I know uh, as Native educators, we got, we got a big mountain to climb. And I really appreciate all your hard work and all your, your people that you partner with that make this possible today. 
and I want to um, extend my um, invitation to all of you to come to this to our school and visit us and spend a day with us. Awesome! Wow, that was great, girls. Um, amazing work. And um, we are going to break for lunch now, and we have uh, Tanea Winder coming up at one o'clock. So please, she's you don't want to miss it. Join us back at one o'clock. Um, have a good lunch. Yeah. All right, it's one o'clock. We'll get back to uh, our afternoon portion of the summit. Um, we'll start off. Uh, we have uh, Tanea Winder speaking for us this afternoon. Um, she's an author, singer, songwriter, poet, and motivational speaker who comes from an inner tribal lineage of Southern Ute, Pyramid, Lake Paiute, and Duckwater Shoshone nations, where she is an enrolled citizen. She received a BA in English from Stanford University and an MFA in creative writing from the University of New Mexico. Winder's uh, creative or poetry collections include words like love and why storms are named after people and bullets remain lame, nameless. Tanea's performances and talks blend storytelling, singing, and spoken word to teach about differential expressions of love and heart work. Her specialties include youth and women empowerment, healing trauma through art, creative writing workshops, and mentally wellness advocacy. So welcome, Tanea. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you all. I'm going to be doing some of what was just shared and be sharing some stories, some songs, and I'm just really grateful to be here to share space with you all. So I have a, a PowerPoint of what I'm going to share. And so, um, you know, today I'm going to talk a little bit about just finding your fire and remembering your purpose. I know everybody here today is in education because you know that's your purpose you know that is your heart work and we all know that heart work can be hard work you know um sometimes the things that we've been asked to do with our lives with our gifts with our light it's not always easy to shine those lights in 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 dark places it's not always easy to do what we've been asked to do and um you know burnout is a real thing it doesn't mean that um you know, there's not ways to to heal and to work through it. And so that's why I like to call it remembering, because for me, it is an act of putting ourselves back together, you know, finding your fire. Sometimes you have to push yourself to find that fire each and every day when you're going through a burnout phase or a tough time or when, you know, we're, we're struggling to support our students or change systems that are always the easiest to change. It is an act of, of igniting that fire and remembering, putting ourselves back together. And so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about, about some of the ways I've been able to find my fire and reignite it and find my purpose. And I hope by the end of this, you've reignited your fire a little bit too, not just my session, but everything that the organizers have put together for us on this beautiful day, just so many wonderful speakers and, and resources. So um, it's a little bit about me, but thankfully Amy read my my bio, so that's lovely. And I'm grateful, thank you, Amy. Um, so today I'm just gonna start us with a little grounding and then I'm gonna talk about storytelling as med, med, medicine. And also um, I'm gonna frame it around this concept of seeds and finding your heart work. So I'm gonna actually start with getting us grounded with this song called, It's a Good Day. And so, Part of my story is also a story of reclaiming, right? You know, my um, my grandmother was taken to boarding school when she was a little girl. And we all know the things that happened in boarding school. So, you know, she didn't feel that being Indian meant anything. She didn't feel like her identity was worthy of, of sharing, of passing on. So she didn't teach my mother her language. She didn't teach us her language. Um, towards the end of her life, we were learning more more phrases, but um, you know, it wasn't something I grew up with. And so learning language of all the nations I carry inside of me, you know, is something that um, I'm really trying to commit these next years of my, my life to. And so I grew up on the Southern Ute Reservation. And one of our elders there, he used to send around this weekly newsletter, and he would have a different phrase in the Ute language in, the, in this letter. Um, and sometimes there were things like, um, it's dark outside, or, hey, there's a raccoon. But one time um, I saw this phrase come across my, my inbox, and it said, um, it's a good day. Tutaveak, it's a good day. And I thought, wow, like, I, I, I you know I could use this phrase every day, because every day is a good day. Every day is a ceremony that we've been gifted to be here to, again, share our gifts and, and live our life and figure out more about who we're supposed to be and who we are. And when I was little, I remember uh, learning a lot of language through songs, um, probably because I always like musicals too. So all the big learning moments happen in songs, right? So I wanted to uh, turn that phrase, to Tuteveak, it's a good day, into a song. So I'm just going to start by sharing that song. Hopefully it doesn't lag too much, and um, I'm going to share it with you. And so it has that phrase, to Tuteveak, throughout it to help me learn and just to help, help ground us. I love I love this song and I'm excited to share it with you. So again, to Tuteveak, it's a good day. Woke up this morning to greet the day lit my sage to give thanks and began to pray hey i asked creator do what you can to guide my path that's all i Say 
Esther, please protect my spirit. Those I hold dearest in my heart. If there are wounds, help me heal them so others know love even for a minute. To That was two Tevayak. It's a good day. I like to say it like that because then I can feel like a, a radio DJ. That was two Tevayak. It's a good day by Tanea Winder. <laughs> but um, you know, it's interesting when you give yourself a, a task to to write a song. Um, it's almost like every time I write, and I encourage you to think about entering the classroom like this way too. This this way too. Every time I write, it's ceremony to me. You know, I try to smudge right before I write. I try to pray um, because I know that it's not about me. The same way teaching and being in that field of education, you know, it's not about us. It's about who we serve and we are just the vessels for the message to come through. And um, that song, you know, for me, that song is like a prayer. I, I love to start my day and, you know, sessions with that song. You know, ancestors, please protect my spirit, those I hold dearest in my heart. If there are wounds, help me heal them. So others know love, even for a minute. So I ask you all to think about what makes it a good day for you? And to think about it like, you know, if you had your ideal day, you know, September sweater, coffee, but also when we have those tough days, how do you make it a good day? I don't know if there's any other Grey's Anatomy fans in the house, but I love Grey's Anatomy. I talk about it so much. My mom, like, who's who's Derek? Who's Meredith? She's like, you guys talk about them like they're real people because my sister and I love the show. But it's not, it's just a show. But um, love the writers on there because last week um, there was a session where this guy, you know, had a tough day with his patients and he was really beating himself up and trying to go down his shame spiral. And the guy invited him, the main doctor invited him to do um. A surgery with him and he said why I just messed up I made so many mistakes today. He said the goal should always be to end the day better than you started it. So again, think about what makes it a good day for you and when you do have those tough days personally and professionally. You know, think about that song think about what makes a good day, how can you stop whatever is happening stop those feelings you're feeling of negativity of those those spirals that we put ourselves in and think how can I make this a good day now because to today it's a good day. And plant those seeds. You know, my mother, she always talked about words being like seeds and it's interesting, you know, when you think about the stories and things that are passed down because um, you know, one of the things my grandparents, my maternal grandparents taught us, my grandpa was a cattle rancher, you know, he taught me don't waste sunlight, he was up, sunrise, you know, dust to dawn, uh, fixing fences, bratting his candle, hurting them, um, irrigating all of those things, and my grandmother was always cooking and making us food and gardening, she taught us how to garden, how to plant those seeds with intention, and that you can't just plant it and leave it there, you know, we can't just plant like these lessons and people we work with and expect them to get it we have to tend our gardens you know give it the water give it the sunlight make sure you pull out those weeds so growing up that way it's no surprise that my mom thinks of words in this way that words are seeds and she always says because words are seeds you have to be careful of the words you say you have to be careful of the words you speak because even when you when you speak it you give life to it you're planting it she goes so far to say is don't even think negative things don't even think those things you know for somebody like like me it, it would show up like i'm i'm not good enough i i can't do that i shouldn't and she'll say stop like don't don't say those things don't plant those seeds and i like to think about it you know with my colleagues with my students as well that metaphor you know you might say to a colleague or a coworker if they make a mistake like 
oh, you're incompetent. How could you make a mistake like that? You're useless. And you might go to lunch and forget that you even said that, but you planted a seed in that person, maybe without knowing, and they go home, that seed takes root and they're thinking about it. And the next day they come, come with that every day. And I always tell my students to think about it that way too, you know, with bullying. Like don't bully other people, don't say negative things because that seed might take root and you never know, you know, the, the, the way you could have altered somebody's life path with that. And again, like when it comes to ourselves, you know, it's important to not bully ourselves as well too. And some people, you know, we might do it with words, like I, like I was saying, um, but some of us, we even do it in actions, you know, we're sneaky like that, you know, we don't apply for that promotion, we don't apply for that fellowship or that grant because we think I'm not going to get it anyway. So even though we're not verbalizing it, even though we're not saying that we're not good enough, we're, we're thinking those things and we're doing it with, with our actions. And I have an example of how this plays out. I've seen it play out, you know, education wise. You know, um, I have this story from when I was in third grade. I mean, I always loved reading, you know, reading was like my safe place I could escape. And I feel like a lot of my friends and I had had a similar relationship to books and to reading. And I remember I had this best friend, uh, his name was George and we would do everything together. We would, you know, call each other before cell phones, you know, for those of you all who know, like with the phones connected to the wall, you have to call and we would make sure we're wearing like matching outfits and just that we we're going to arrive to school at the exact same time and all of those things. We did everything together. And so, you know, in class, we were both in this advanced reading group and we both were like determined to win those book it competitions that Pizza Hut, I don't know if they still do them, but they did it when if you read a certain amount of books, you got free personal pan pizza. And this kind of shows just how competitive I was because I didn't even like pizza, but I just wanted to win. You know, I wanted to win that book competition. Um, you know, but my friend George, he had some health issues. So occasionally he'd have to miss class because of those issues. And there was one time George, he had to miss maybe two weeks of class. And when we finally got back to school, our teacher, Ms. Christensen, said he needed to be put in a lower reading group. Of course, she didn't say it as nicely, um, but, you know, I was this person who always wanted to fight for justice. You know, my mom taught me about these words of seeds. I loved musicals. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to fight for truth and justice, just like in the movies I saw when I was younger. So when my teacher you know, just told my friend that he couldn't be in the same reading group, I thought, well, I'm going to speak up for him because this seems like a small thing that could, that could easily be fixed. You know, I, I, um, I was raised to speak up against against bullies and in that particular situation, I, I thought my teacher was being the bully. So I walked up to her and I said, Miss Christensen, I, I can help George so he gets get caught up. He lives right around the corner from me. You know, I can tutor him. I can I can help him. And her response it wasn't just like a no today I said what I said it was you know she screamed at me she yelled at me in front of the whole class and just said Tanea as soon as I said you and George couldn't be in the same group I saw wheels are turning you can't help him and he can't be in the group you know to this day hearing the words you can't it it hits me in my gut you know my teacher who was supposed to guide us had stopped George from doing his best you know, and my school was small. It, they weren't overpacked classrooms. Like it was a doable ask. But the fact is, Ms. Christensen didn't believe that George was smart enough to get caught up. But he was. He was smart enough. And there was a lot that Ms. Christensen, a white teacher on our checkerboard reservation, didn't know. She didn't care to know or even try to understand the struggles of the community she was in the community she was supposed to serve. And there's things she couldn't have known. No, she didn't know that George's father was an alcoholic who would eventually die from drinking, falling asleep on a bench during winter, freezing to death. She didn't know that his mom struggled with drinking too, that by the time we got to high school, his mom would have to be on dialysis. And sometimes I think maybe Miss Christensen couldn't handle the truths of the community she was serving, you know, about the, the, the socioeconomic factors, the, the struggles, the historical trauma, all of the things that informed 
some of the things we acted out, the ways we responded, you know, the grief we were dealing with. And I share that story with you all because now having worked with students that young, you know, I realize I see just how little I was trying to speak truth to this person in a position of power, this person who was supposed to teach us and guide us. And it still angers me to think how she treated both, both George and me. You know, but she did teach me some really valuable lessons. She taught me that, you know, not everybody who acts like they're in your corner actually is. And that in this life, especially in education, that you're going to have to learn to advocate for yourself. And that some people and institutions who are supposed to support you don't always end up doing that. And that finally, you know, some people will try to place limits on you by telling you words meant to define you, your heart and your ability. You know, I talked about words being seeds and that you have to be careful of the words you speak because words have power and they have that power to uplift and empower, but they also have that power to harm. And our words should do no harm and the seeds we plant should be placed with good intentions. So to this day, it still angers me that the words Ms. Christensen planted in my eight-year-old friend was the message that he was not enough. You know, that seed of doubt that she planted in him lasted all through high school when George thought he wasn't enough. He thought he wasn't smart enough to be in school with the rest of us, so he switched to alternative school and from there our paths were forever diverged. And some of you might be aware um, of the these, these statistic, you know, but we you know more than 60% of US high school students go on to college, while only 17% of American Indian students are able to continue their education after high school. And according to Lumbee scholar, Dr. Brian Brayboy, you know, currently for every 100 native students that enroll in ninth grade, 48 will graduate. And of those 48, 20 will go on to post-secondary institution. And of those 20, only one will attain a degree, which means that it takes 2,500 native ninth graders to create one master's graduate and 7,500 to create a PhD. So sometimes the odds can be stacked against you. So when it feels like the world is stacked against you, how do you move forward? It took me a long time to realize that healing isn't an achievement. It's not a goal post or a destination or this magic place of peace. You arrive at one day, I'm healed. You know, it's not like that. It's a process. Um, and for many of us, for everybody, you know, that process continues each and every day. Part of my own growth in learning some of these lessons come with, you know, many of the things that people in our communities struggle with. You know, I was, um, I was raised to believe that alcohol wasn't meant for our spirit. And yet myself and my peers all struggled with alcohol abuse and, and misuse when we were younger. You know, when we were less than 18 in high school, you know, binge drinking. My high school wasn't all that challenging. So my GPA stayed high and no one really noticed. You know, I was struggling on the inside when I was drinking. And for me personally, when I look back on that time, I. I think about the reasons I started drinking and I know a lot of it had to do with loss. You know, my father wasn't the healthiest at the time. Um, you know, my grandfather, who was very much a stable father figure, passed away unexpectedly in a ranching accident when I was in high school. And, you know, losing him definitely made me lose my faith at that time. And I continued drinking and I dropped out of school for a little while because my grandpa, you know, he was one of the main supporters for me for going to college. So I decided I'd stay home, you know, after he died. Um, I had enough credits to graduate, so I thought I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna work at the casino. I had a job there as a waitress. I thought this is what I'm gonna do. And I did that for a few weeks before I realized that wasn't a healthy decision. I'd made that decision out of hurt and not from my place of power. And, you know, I realized I shouldn't judge myself or my people or any people for drinking because for, I could see it as a coping mechanism, as a numbing mechanism for all the traumas we cycle through 
you know, as a result of history, as a result of growing up and being who we are in this country that tried to get rid of us. So, you know, I decided I wanted to go back to school. I didn't want to, you know, be a, be a dropout. I needed to go back to finish um, and make sure that everything was just taken care of in a good way. So when I asked the principal if I could go back, you know, I grew up on a checkerboard reservation. So there was a lot of tension between enrolled tribal members and not enrolled and descendants and also um, a, a majority of our community and our school was was white so we could be standing here and then go across the street and we'd be like in the city so i'd stand here beyond the res over there in the city so it's a lot of tensions so there was a lot of racism and so when i asked to, to go back to school my principal he said i was too far behind and mind you that i was in line to be salutatorian and by this point, I had interviews at, at Yale, I had applied to Stanford, all these things, but he told me that there was no way that I could get caught up. And those words immediately triggered me back to that third grade experience with Ms. Christensen, and my friend George. And so, you know, I went to our, our counselor, she was this awesome white ally, and she advocated for me and she got the principal to agree, okay, if, if, if she can get any teacher to let her back into the class this late in the semester, she can go back to school. And the only teacher willing to let me back into his classroom that late in the semester was Mr. B. And Mr. B just so happened to be teaching a spoken word poetry class. And I'd, I'd written poetry like in fifth grade, I'd never written it seriously. Um, and the final was to perform in a poetry slam at the end of the semester in a nearby town. And I hated being up in front of people. I hated public speaking and all that. And I was like, oh man, but what am I gonna do? This is the only way to get back into school. So I thought, all right, I'm gonna do it. And poetry was all the medicine I didn't know I needed. You know, I could write about my grief. I could write about things I needed to process. You know, poetry, taught me balance and patience and it helped me forgive so many of the hurts that happened. I could, I could write about, you know, anything I wanted. I could write how I felt alone and the page never judged me. And it always provided an outlet for whatever I was feeling inside. And so, you know, we went to the poetry slam and today I sit before you as a published poet you know, my book, one of my books is in the largest library in the world. It's in the British Library in London. Um, I've, I've put my books in libraries all across the country. And so I always think it'd be a cool story if I'm like, and then I performed in that poetry slam and I won first place and that's how I knew I was meant to be a poet. Um, but, you know, I didn't even place, I didn't even make it to the next round. But for the first time in my life, it didn't matter being the best didn't matter, winning didn't matter. It was about how poetry made me feel. I felt powerful sharing words that I had written about my own experience walking this earth. And that's why I'm so excited to be alive in this time now where we can see those shows like Rutherf Rutherford Falls or Reservation Dogs, where we can see ourselves you know, reflected and we see our stories and we say, hey, I know somebody like that in my community or that's kind of calling me out. Did they know about me when they wrote that? You know, representation matters. It helps us feel powerful. It helps us feel seen, which is why events like this are so wonderful to be a part of as well. You know, performing poetry made me feel seen and I'll always be grateful to my teacher, Mr. B, for giving me those tools to liberate myself because he taught me some powerful lessons too. You know, he taught me that sometimes hope and help come from the most unexpected places and someone else can offer you the tools to heal yourself, but only you have the power to actually heal yourself. Poetry and storytelling was that healing medicine. And again, I wanna share that with you all because you are that hope. And maybe you are an expected place, but maybe to some people it is unexpected some people who haven't had kindness and have been literally crawling and digging their nails and getting to where they are so they meet you as that point of intervention, that interruption onto sometimes the negative paths we, we find ourselves on. And the second part, you know, about how someone can offer you the tools to heal yourself, but only you can, 
I say that because now having been in education myself, you know, you, you can't help everybody. You know, you can give the tools, but it's up to the students. I know, and I know that firsthand. I know you all probably know that firsthand too. You know, you, we can give all the tools, but we can't make them use it. It's up to them to do that. And we can find them empowerment. We can find the motivation, but you know how they say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And I want to share that just for anyone who might need to hear it to be kind to yourself, you know, because you're doing the best you can. You do the best you can. And we always hope and pray, you know, that that is enough. And so with that, I'm going to share um, one more song. And if I have time, I'll do another one. But this one I actually wrote for my students. Um, you know, I didn't realize getting into education. I probably should have like also gone my gone to so school for social work because you just always having to do so many different things. Um, and I didn't realize, you know, I've I've lost a good friend of mine to suicide, and that's why I write and wanted to get into education. But I didn't realize how many people, how many youth and young people, just have to survive so much. I found myself having to make so many calls to child protective services and not even knowing if those were good systems and they felt broken but i'm a state mandated reporter and i have to do my job and um at times it felt hopeless you know just all the all the things and you know battling with the i'm not savior complex i'm i'm not a savior it's not my job to save people but i want to be a good relative and i want to help how do i do all of those things and for me again it comes back to what i was sharing with that first song it comes down um, to prayer, you know, I was I was raised in ceremony. I I believe that those songs and our language and the things that survived um, help us in our survival. They they contain so many things that even we don't know. I believe our ancestors are always watching out for us, and so sometimes all you can do um, is pray. And so when I was going through those moments of just feeling helpless, feeling hopeless, what can I do? I wrote this song. It's called um, "Pray for You." Because prayer, whatever your form of prayer or whatever your beliefs or whatever your medicine is, you know, teaching is medicine, writing is medicine, like all of those things, um, they help, they matter. And so I'm going to share this song. It's called Pray For You. And again, I wrote it for my students and just encourage you to think of it, too, if there's ever times where, you know, you do feel powerless. Remember, you always have a gift you can offer. It's just called Pray For You. He told me that he just wasn't enough The world told him as a man to be tough You got tears, son, you just bottle them up Is this love? Kept telling me how everything went wrong. She kept singing these sad, sad songs. Asked the sky to please open up. Is this love? Is this love? All I could do. I 
do is pray. I'll pray for you. 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 So yeah, I want to encourage you all to remember just the power of prayer when you feel hopeless, when you feel powerless, just to remember that you do, you always have power. You always have something that you can give, that you can give back. So I want to share with you all a story that comes from, you know, my mother's homeland. This comes from the Pyramid Lake Paiute Reservation, and so I'm going to share with you a picture of it. So this is our stone mother. And she's naturally occurring like that. You know, she wasn't formed. She wasn't, she was made, she was just made by creator like that, made out of tufa rock and it's her basket that sits next to her. And it actually looks like some of the baskets from, from her homeland there. And so I've heard this story um, in different ways. You know, my mother tells it like, the stone mother had four daughters, North, East, South, and West. And when they were, when they were little, each, and they grew up, each went their own direction and they never came back. And so the mother cried so many tears. She created this lake in the middle of the desert. And I think my mom tells us this version because she always knew we'd leave to go to school. I think she wanted to guilt us into always coming back. So that's my mom's version of the story. But I used to emphasize so empathize so much with that story because like I said, you know, I showed you a snippet, snippet of my life, but just growing up seeing so much loss you know, I got to this point where I became desensitized, where I couldn't cry when you were supposed to, when I just felt so hardened. And I thought, is this my inheritance? Am I too made of stone? I can't feel. And, you know, for many of us, we grow up swimming in this lake. And so we return every summer, my family and I, and we swim. And I remember swimming after after a hardship i was going through some loss and some grief and i remember swimming and i remember thinking wow the stone mother gave us the greatest gift a mother or a relative could give she gave us this tool to heal because if i think about the story and i'll tell you another version of it in a second but i'm swimming in tears and i believe that i believe in this creation story and isn't that just a beautiful metaphor for life. Because unfortunately, you know, we'll all know pain, we'll all know sadness, but how do you not drown in it? So I was swimming and I just felt gratitude because the Stone Mother gave us that gift to navigate life's traumas. You can swim. And some of us, you know, and there's times in our lives where sadness and grief hit us wave after wave and you might feel like you can't swim but you can float on your back. You can tread water, you can take a breath and, and recoup and figure out which direction you're gonna swim next. And I felt so grateful. And it was so weird because right around the time that I felt like I got gifted that lesson, I was connecting with another relative of mine. His name is Ralph Burns um, and he's um, a culture bearer in our community. And he told me the story that you know the original mother and the original father had four children when they were little they got along but as they got older they started arguing and bickering as as we humans do and they said okay if you all keep fighting i'm going to separate you sure enough they kept arguing not getting along so they said all right i'm going to send two of you to the north two of you to the south when you get to where you're going make sure you light your fire so that we know you're okay so days pass, days pass, time passed. The, the mother and father see a fire lit in one direction, but they never see a fire lit in the other direction. So because they didn't know if their kids were okay, that's why the mother cried so many tears that she created this lake in the middle of the desert. And I share that because I think that story has so many valuable lessons. You know, for me, as an educator, as a public speaker, I always struggle with this balance between sharing 
sharing the things I've survived, sharing my accomplishments, because I want anyone to know that they can do whatever their heart is set on. And I want to be inspiring, but I also don't want to be, you know, full of myself or have a big ego. How do I maintain that humility, which is such so important to stay humble. And I always find myself coming back to this story because if you remember, they say they wanted their children to light their fire. So they knew they were okay. And I think our ancestors, and we all have them, our ancestors want to know that we're okay. They want us to light our fire while we're here on this earth so they know that we're okay. And so I ask you all to think about, you know, what is your fire? What does lighting your fire look like? It doesn't have to be being YouTube or TikTok or Instagram famous and having thousands and thousands of followers. It might be being a good leader. It might be being the best teacher you can be. For me, it, it might it means being the best auntie I can be now. So I can heal things that, you know, when people were mean to me when I was little, I have the most sensitive, sweet little nephew and I get to heal those things. Like that's my fire. So think, what is your fire? How are you igniting it? Because there's so many ways to let your fire burn. You know, in this life, people say, check off a box. Are you American Indian? Are you black? Are you a teacher? Are you single? Are you married? You know, I hate being put in a box. Fire has no box, right? Fire is used for so many things. We use fire for camping. We use fire for warmth. Fire is used in ceremony. Fire is used to bring people together. People sing songs around the fire. Like fire has all these different uses and the fire inside you has all of those different uses as well. So think about your fire. Think about what your superhero power is because that is how you turn pain into power. That is how you turn hopelessness into hope. So if, think about that, think about your fire, think about your superpower. For me, I do feel for me, it is turning pain into power through words, through music. Because to me, that is, that is hard work. I've shared a little bit about who I am, where I'm from, what I do and why. And all of us have our own answers to these questions. You know, who are you? Where are you from? Who do you belong to? Who are you accountable to? What do you do and why? Because that is the template for your heart work. That is how you'll find your heart's work. And your heart work can change. It can morph just like fire can dim and blaze. You can choose how you want to show your, share your heart work and ignite that. For me, it's about unpacking love. You know, I used to be um, a very fearful person. I used to always, actually, I still am very fearful and I have a lot of anxiety, but I just, I created this to ground myself. I have to keep it, keep it 100, keep it real with you all. Can't say I used to be a fearful. I still have fear, but this is how I try to think of fear now. You know, I, um, I had this one lady tell me one time, she said, well, you know what fear is, right? It's false expectations about reality. And it got me to think about things differently, but it wasn't resonating with me. So that's why I made this one, fiercely embrace ancestral resilience. Whenever I feel fearful or anxious, I think about my grandmother. I think about how strong and brave she was when she was taken from her home when she was a little girl, how strong and brave she had to be. You know, I get afraid if I'm, I'm lost or on the wrong bus and I have this phone that can get me out of, you know, I can help find my way. But, you know, my grandmother didn't have a phone back then. She was just placed in another city to have to work and take care of other people's children and homes. And I always think about how brave she was and how she came through still so loving and kind and tender. So whenever I feel fearful or anxious, I think about that. Fiercely embrace ancestral resil resilience. If I'm afraid, I know what my ancestors have survived and overcome so I could be here today. And I am fiercely going to embrace their resilience. Because what a lot of what we do in the classroom is that reframing. You know, don't think about fear as this big scary monster. Think about it like this. It has its own spirit and you can change the vantage point. One quick example is of fear. You know, we teach people to run away from things. If you don't do your homework, you're going to end up jobless, houseless, and working at McDonald's. If you don't do this, you're going to end up that. And it teaches our young people, it teaches us to run away from these big scary monsters. Like, isn't that creating? an anxious person. But like I was talking about reframing fear, how can we reframe those words 
those seeds we plant so that people aren't running away from something, but they're running towards something. They're running towards hope. They're running towards healing. They're running to their dreams. Again, fiercely embrace ancestral resilience. You know, I had a therapist phrase it really beautifully, and I'll, I'll, I'll close out by sharing that with you all, because I said, you know, that, you know, she was saying, like, when parents say that, if you don't do this, you're going to end up that it comes from their place of fear. They're afraid their kid's not going to be okay. They're afraid their kid's not going to go to college. And because they respond from that fear, they're teaching them to run away. So we saw Velma running away from the scary dinosaur. And you have to break that down. You know, and it's hard for a, a young person. It's hard for even us as adults to break that down. You know, I know my parents said this and it seemed like they were angry and but there's but underneath their anger is fear they're scared that i'm not going to be okay but underneath that is love so how can we strip away that fear how can we strip away that anger and make it that we approach language we approach the lessons we approach the things that we teach from a place of love a place of kindness for me that is the power of heart work Thank you all for, for being here and for sharing space and listening to these stories. It, it always makes my heart feel good to share because I still struggle with, you know, my own version of survivor's guilt. I'm not the most smartest person in my family or my community or the most talented poet or singer or writer, um, but I get to be here in these spaces. And I often think about, you know, my friend who I lost to suicide or, or my friend George from the story. And I think, why can't they be here today sharing their stories, sharing their lessons of all the things they've survived and overcome. And I do struggle with that survivor's guilt, but I have to tell myself again, I have to reframe that in my mind because I am here, because I get to be here with you. What am I gonna do with that gift of living? So if you feel any of those things, if you feel fear, fear, reframe it. Fiercely embrace ancestral resilience, frame it to what makes, frame it to what makes sense for you if that doesn't. If you feel guilt or shame, flip it again. You are here. Today is a good day to Teveak. What are we going to do to continue making it a good day each and every day so we can keep swimming and keep igniting our fires? Thank you all so much. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Tanea. Uh, there's some comments in the chat box. Does anybody have any questions for Tanea? Um, I just, I guess, would want to, um, God, it, you're, it was just amazing to listen to you speak just because it just hits almost, um, gosh, I almost want to cry while you're sitting here listening to it because it just hits so close to home, like in educating in my own background and then thinking about how, what, what I want to be or who I want to be as an educator. And, uh, and I've had to learn those things over the years myself about, um, stress even or about things that I feel like like with our children and with even our students where you're like gosh they don't even understand what um stress is or they don't even understand what um you know what we've been uh, you have lived through or what we've been through in our communities and uh, it kind of brings it back to um that understanding that even though their stress is different that we still have to understand they have stress and I don't know, you just kind of brought, I have all kinds of things written down from what you have said, and it just really touched me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Hello? How are you today? Uh, I just want to say your stories were amazing and heartfelt, and I really appreciate you um, being um, uh, vulnerable in a space that is uh, currently with 87 participants. And um, thank you for that. Thank you. I like your name, Craigosaurus. Thank you. Okay, hey, well, I, I just want to say thank you again to Naya, and I'm glad this all worked out that we was able to bring you 
to an audience in our community um, when I heard your presentation. I don't know how long ago that was. I was just like, wow, you know, this message needs to be shared um, because it is, it's relatable to probably most all native communities, which, which you're, which you've seen, which you've grown up with. So um, just again, thank you. And um, yeah, if there's nothing else, we can move on to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Memphis is going to pre be presenting next. Um, yeah. Thank you again, Amy. I appreciate all that you do. Yeah, no problem. Um, so we have Memphis Justo from uh, Santee Public Schools up next. Um, she's a Santee Dakota and currently teaches third grade at Asante. Uh, community school in Santee, Nebraska. She's in her 16th year of teaching elementary grade students. She got her associate's degree from Nebraska Indian Community College in 2004 and continued on as part of the Indigenous Roots Education Program, graduating with honors from the University of Nebraska Lincoln with the Bachelor's of Science in Education in 2007. While teaching, Memphis continued her education and received a master's degree from Wayne State College in 2013 and is currently attending the UNL uh, P12 School Leadership Program. So uh, I'll turn it over to Memphis. Thank you. All right. Well, I kind of feel like I have a, a tough act to follow there, but I guess I am more um, here information and just kind of to share um, some of what's going on with our Indigenous Roots program currently and um, in the past and hopefully into the future. So a little bit about myself, I guess you, how we always answer like, who, who are you or who I am? I answer with the regular go-to all the time of I'm a wife, a mother, a teacher, and now I, I'm a grandmother. Um, but I don't actually know if those answer the question of who I am, because there's a lot more to me than the basic who I am. I am Native American and I am white. Um, I married into a Mexican family. I often the edges between all of those cultural beliefs um, are blurred between the three of those. Um, I feel like I have many hats that I use while I'm in different situations of my life. And I think it's because of how I, I grew up and how I've been surrounded by people of many backgrounds um, that I just uh, have, excuse me, have had all these different life situations. Um, I don't feel like I was necessarily raised, but more um, guided or, or guided through life. I just grew up is, is the way I like to say it. Um, I was brought up in the way where you, you uh, do as I say and not as I do. And during that time, I was often the adult figure to my siblings from a very young age. I held a lot of responsibility and became the protector of stuff in the midst of what we grew up in. So it is from this that I wanted to be that somebody, that positive somebody for um, started out when I decided to go back to college for my children because I did graduate from Santee Community School in 1997, so a long time ago now. And I went on to complete one year of college at Nebraska Indian Community College. And then I went off to um, join the workforce for many years and uh, travel around a bit and then got married and started uh, started a family. And it was in that that I decided that I wanted more for my children. And I always had that, um, even before that, I, I always, I think, knew I wanted to be an educator because I knew I wanted to make a difference in um, the lives of children and be that somebody. But it, that, that gave me more of a push once I started having children of my own because um, I wanted to have, give them a better life and... Um, kind of, I think, be that person, also show them um, that your hard work will pay off and that what, you know, you can work for something and better your life. So I moved back to Santee after traveling around for quite a while. And I completed my, like she said, my associates through Nebraska Indian Community College. 
and then got to be, was thankfully introduced to the Indigenous Brits program. Um, after I completed, I was decided I was going to go on to Wayne to become a, uh, do my education program. And it was awful, actually, because I lived in Santee. So I drove back and forth um, from Wayne to Santee, you know, so three or four times a week. And uh, I had small children. I had uh, two six-year-olds a um, and a three-year-old at the time. And I was pregnant with my youngest or maybe not quite yet, but it would be coming. Um, so when I was introduced to the Indigenous Rich Program, it sounded like the perfect um, combination of being able to get a degree because you get to have the degree in your own community, which is where I'm going to start if I can share my screen here. And um, I will talk a little bit about the Indigenous Rich Program. Hold on. I'm sorry. I had it pulled up right there and it is not. Is your tab green? Yeah, I'm going to, I think it's going to go right now. So we'll see. Oh, it's making me do open system preferences and such. So I don't know what it's doing. Allow Zoom to share your screen. Hmm. I'm not sure what it's doing. If anybody has any, I might, maybe I'm not set up for sharing, but I don't see where to add that. Yet. So make her the presenter. We walked away. Yes, if she's not the presenter, it won't work. How is it gonna, are you working on switching it over? Let me message him because he might have stepped away. Oh, yeah. Okay, so at the bottom of your screen, if you scroll down there, there's a bunch of icons at the bottom, and you can click that share screen there. Okay. It'll be a green, a green uh, icon there. Yep. Okay, and then just hit that arrow, or go ahead and click on that, and you should be able to start sharing your screen. It makes me, it has some options here that say desktop one. So if I click on the desktop, then hit share, then it goes to allow Zoom to share your screen. Yes. Open preferences. So I'm not sure what it wants me to do after that because. So you have two different uh, monitors then? No, I'm just on my computer. Okay, go ahead and select that desktop one then. Oh, all right. Yeah, it still wants me to, uh, I don't know, open your, all right, Nancy, are you on here? Maybe you can just open it and I will talk about it. I'm here. Uh, what do you want me to open? Uh, what the, um, PDF you, you sent. Email it to me. Okay. Okay. That one. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> I don't have it out. I don't think. All uh, right. For some reason, the settings changed. Go ahead and try it again. Okay. So it wants me to grant access, but then 
when I hit the place to allow, it doesn't do anything. All right, well, um, in the meantime, I will just, you guys can just listen to me <laughs> if that works. So we aren't sitting here um, holding everybody up while I'm trying to figure this out. Um, no, no, I don't. Does that work? Yes, there it is. Okay, you just tell me what you want. All right. So, um, yeah, basically, I was just kind of going to zoom through this. So okay. this wasn't necessary. This is kind of just to give you guys some base information on what the Indigenous uh, Teacher Education Program is. So we can just kind of scroll through it, Nancy. Okay, and now I've got to get to the next page. Hold on. How do I do that? This is. Uh, well, if you download it, then you should be able to open it like a presentation. Okay, let me see. Um, why is it not? All I'm seeing is the first page. Well, let you arrow over or arrow down. That's what I was trying to do. Um, oh, here, 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 here. All right, so the um, the T, uh, Indigenous Roots will originally started out as um, Career Ladder uh, grant came along because we have seen that the Native American teachers are underrepresented within our schools. Okay. Yeah, seriously, I'm just, I'm gonna kind of, that's why I wish I could just click, 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 because I'm just kind of, kind of zoom through. That's what I'm so, doing. <laughs> yeah, there, there's kind of, uh, you know, this is, uh, the data is old, it's from 1999, but it just gives you the idea of the population of the schools and then how many Native American teachers are there. Thankfully, because of our program, we have more Native American teachers within most of these schools. Um, so the, go ahead and go on. The overreaching um, goal is to to lead K-12 Native American students um, in uh, rural reservation and urban communities across Nebraska to academic success. We want to develop a strong educational program um, in both rural and urban Native communities to build the capacity in Native American communities. Um, the program certifies Native American teachers to work in predominantly Native American schools and communities. Um, some of the university, well, it's the is through the University of Nebraska Lincoln, but they have um, partnerships with like Little Priest Tribal College and the uh, Nebraska Indian Community College. And the reason we have those partnerships is because this uh, program is designated to help teacher or help us to get our degree within the community that we live in uh, with very little travel. So with those partnerships, it allows us to take classes, still UNL classes, but they can be offered through um, the other colleges to help get through that degree. Um, the reservation schools that would be Santee and Nybera Public School, um, they also have St. Augustine, uh, Omaha Nation, Walt Hill, and Winnebago Public Schools. And they have some urban schools Omaha, in Omaha and Lincoln that are have people that have gone through the program. Um, what the program does and the partnerships is they maximize the resources and ac access to instruction for Native American uh, teachers and students in rural areas. And just to go off on a personal note there, like this, that program or the program definitely helped me in that case because I was able to stay in my community rather than drive. And I had my kids right here. So for daycare wise, and sometimes I wouldn't have a uh, daycare and my kids would come along to my class and sit under the table and color while I was in class. So that made it beneficial in that way. Um, they also build the capacity for rural schools and communities to promote, promote uh, sustainable employment and opportunities, promote uh, student achievement and pot potential for student success from pre-K to post-secondary, improves communication amongst the partners, students, schools, and communities, and also supports tribal leadership in the field of education and collaborates with state agencies and institutions. Uh, all of this creates a ripple effect within our um, Native nations and getting educators into the school. 
Oops. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So the Indigenous Roots Program is a basically a grow your own, um, a GYO program. It's uh, grow your own. Um, what is the GYO? It's uh, called G GYO is grow your own. Oh, grow your own. There you go. You're grow your own. So we have strong partnerships, community based recruitment. Um, I have been a site mentor, so I have worked on recruiting students um, to come into there. I mean, I have people ask me all the time about when I went through and how I got through. Um, and uh, we have the opportunity with the paid based experience and just the structured pa uh, pathway throughout our schools. As we are, go ahead and go on. Those are the schools that are participants. Um, so the, the grant has, those are the two different grants that have run. The one that went through 1999 to 2005, I started on the end, the tail end of the career ladder program. And then I graduated in 2004 under the Indigenous Roots Teacher Education Program. Um, and that's currently into the present. Yep. Program goals and activities. So we collaborate with area community colleges to offer general education coursework um, equivalent to UNL's bachelor in education, recruit students, uh, including paraprofessionals who work and are paid by the schools, implement program services, advertising, financial aid, tutoring to serve students, develop a teacher mentoring program, develop learning experiences, practicum and student teaching in reservations and other school settings, provide opportunities for students to enroll, uh, for enrolled students in monthly, uh, which uh, includes getting monthly stipends during the coursework and during the induction period. Schedule coursework on-site and online during the full academic year, fall, spring and summer. So it is a, a challenging program where we are going to school year round while you are in the program. Um, but the, like it mentioned, some of the benefits of that is that we get the stipend. So that helps with the living expenses and, um, and pretty much you don't have to worry about anything. I mean, that is, this grant is fabulous in financing wise, uh, or funding wise, because I got through the program without any student loan debt at all. Um, uses field-based and online learning and hybrid teaching approaches. So initially they use the distance labs classrooms in all native communities on site to broadcast from UNL schools. So that's how I started out. I would come into um, Santee Community School here and sit in their distance learning lab and take almost all my classes through there. Uh, the I, I feel like the one downfall of that for me would have been like being alone all the time because at the time when I started, um, uh, most of my classes, I was the only person here in Santee. Uh, as we went on, I did get another student that joined and that definitely helps. And, and the way that our classes are set up now is with Zoom and, um, you know, getting together here and there definitely helps too. Um, in this, within the program, we do get, have access to uh, laptops um, and, you know, can work it here at the school. I do a lot of my homework here in the evening because even just living rural, it's a hard to get internet um out in my community so I'll do a lot of my work here at school after I get done um our instructors will travel to visit the students in their homes and communities and that's always a great way because then the instructors actually get to come right to us at least once or twice during the semester so that they uh we're getting that face to face and like it says most UNL or most classes are now hybrid or online um, with some face-to-face -face included in the programs like Canvas, Zoom, and Google Communities. That's just kind of a little more. That's when they convert uh, converted a UNL classroom into a commuter uh, or a UNL classroom and made it fully equipped, and that was one of their. Um, teacher apartments that they made into the computer for people to go to and access. The program requirements for students would be uh, complete you all UNL coursework for elementary certification and ESL concentration. 
um, graduates earn a bachelor's degree for initial certification in elementary education, K-8. Um, complete three to four practicum student teaching semesters in partnership schools and work uh, eight to 20 hours per week as a paraprofessional. Uh, pass the Praxis One required in, of all UNL pre-service teachers prior to methods coursework. Pass Praxis Two during some uh, student teaching um, that's required in all student teachers and elementary edu edu elementary certifications. Coursework and portfolios integrate culturally relevant and language-based approaches. And the two-year induction period where graduates are supported in their new placement and job. So that's a huge um, benefit of being in the program for me was that I had, um, I had someone in my corner through all of that. So as I was going through and getting my bachelor's degree, like I said, I had um, four or three small children, four. My son was born in 2005, so shortly after. And um, he actually came with me. Uh, I had him on a Saturday evening, got home Sunday, and I went to class on Monday with him because I had a class that was a summer class and I did not, I had to have that class to graduate by the time I wanted to graduate and I was not gonna miss it or make it up later. Um, but within that, I have, Nancy was in my corner. There was times when I felt like there was no way I could do this. It was so much work. It was um, so hard with having my little kids. And at one point in here, my husband, um, we were doing immigration for him and he was gone for uh, two years during that immigration process and that while as well, I was going to college. So if I didn't have Nancy and tutors and all uh, the stipend and all the, the benefits of this program, I honestly don't know if it would have been something that I would have completed on my own. Um, even though I wanted it badly um, without all that support, I don't know if it would have been something that I could have done. Um, so I'm always like eternally grateful for this program and getting me where, uh, getting me to where I am now which that goes on to here with some of the financial support. Um, the grant that cover, covers the monthly stipend for full-time students. Um, it also covers tuition and fees for all required courses that are offered through UNL, Little Priest Tribal College and Nebraska Indian Community College. It covers costs of textbooks and other classroom supplies. It covers costs of your criminal history fees, Praxis II, uh, PPST fees, teaching license and technical fees. So there's, not a lot that has to come out of your pocket um, when you are within this Indigenous Roots program. The main thing you have to put in is the time and effort. So you have to want it and want to put the work in because if you do, then you are going to succeed because everybody wants you to, to succeed. Uh, the university um, also, the support that you get is it brings the program. I feel like uh, some of the stuff I just kind of ad-libbed and said already, but brings it right into your home communities. Um, the fi there's financial aid and advising services um, within general education courses. They're coordinated in the tribal colleges and then the career services, you know, they're there to help you when you graduate to get a job and also, um, you know, check in on you throughout the time after you graduate. So then there's our graduates um, and we have had 55 degrees or initial certifications that have been awarded. Uh, we have nine students have, who have earned master's and additional certification and education administration certifications. And there are some of our different graduates, right? Yeah, so there's a bunch of our graduates that have gone through the program. I'm not gonna read everybody's names off, but it, it, you know, if you look at it, it's just, this is what we want uh, in our schools. It, we want more Native American teachers. And this program is a great way to get Native American teachers. So I am currently, um, the current gr uh, grant is for the, Um, so my current endeavor is through the University of Nebraska with the Indigenous Roots Program. I am part of the Educational Administration uh, admin, uh, P-12 School Leadership Program. This is a two-year hybrid program. Uh, this degree is fully funded through the Indigenous Roots Grant Program. It is like the bachelor's in the way that I do have a payback agreement. 
And whereas if I don't take on an administrative position after two years of graduating, that I will have to um, work towards paying back um, the grant money that I was given. But I am thankful for this opportunity to further my education. And I am excited for what the future holds because I know that all education, whether I end up going into administration or stay where I'm at, I'm learning leadership skills that are gonna help me in my classroom and leadership skills that are gonna help me to be a better teacher um, and just ways to work within my school. So uh, I don't really know what the future holds for me if I will go uh, into administration, but I know this opens up the door that if I want to, then I have this in my toolbox. Um, thank you, Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, besides that, I don't know, um, do I have, do you guys have any questions, um, about the program? Um, or, you know, I guess if you have someone or, you know, someone, cause I know that it's in the works to get back into, uh, the next grant cycle, hopefully to have it opened up for, um, the bachelor's degrees again, and hopefully that will be within the next year. So I guess the one requirement I didn't talk about is that you do have to have uh, 60 credit hours or an associate's degree to start out. Otherwise, it would just take so long because it's already three years. That's three years like summers and summer, spring, fall, you know, the whole every session. So they, you, you do have to have the 60 credit hours to start out. So if you have anyone who is in that realm and they want to go into education, then this is a great program to look into getting into. And that's all I have, unless you have questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Nymphus. Uh, is there any questions for her or about the program? Maybe her or Nancy could uh, answer. Do you want to <clears throat> A little bit about the school leader program, the master, like the class you took this summer and what you guys did. Um, my, oh, yeah, in our pro, <laughs> I, okay, yes, I can talk a little more. But so this summer, um, in the class that, uh, we took, we did, uh, a research project. And I guess our research project was about state testing. Um, all three of us, we worked in a group of three and all three of us were pretty um, interested in school testing and and because all, all of our reservation schools, all of almost our reservation schools are very poor performing in the state tests. And um, I don't have it in front of me, but basically our research shows what most of us already know is that our tests that we have are bias and, um, you know, they are set up for in the European style of learning and it's not there there's our kids don't have the background knowledge um needed to be successful in a lot of the state testing so that was a big project and um i i wish i had it in front of me because i could give you more information than that but and where did you present it oh uh, we uh presented at at admin days down in lincoln um yeah we were in lincoln i think or no we weren't we were in, where were we grand island or carney but there was the administration days we're in Kearney. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Nephthys. Yes, thank you so much. Um, next and uh, last on our agenda for today, we're probably going to end a little early, which is okay. Um, we have Barbara Buttes from the Nebraska Department of Education. <clears throat> She's an enrolled Yankton Sioux tribal member from uh, Chateau Creek, South Dakota. She's a descendant from the um, Minnesota, they say that, <laughs> oh, Sioux tribe. Uh, she has a son and a daughter, four grandsons. <laughs> one granddaughter and one great granddaughter. She earned her BA from the University of California, Berkeley, and her MA from UCLA, both in American Indian Studies, History, and Law. Taking her Doctor of Philosophy from UCLA and Social 
Cultural Anthropology, Dr. Butes wrote her dissertation on Minnesota Sioux women and cultural transformation after the 1862 Sioux, Sioux War. She's taught anthropology and American Indian studies at California State University, Long Beach, Minnesota State University, Mankato, Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota, and at Arizona State University West. Through her firm, Winchopi Research and Consulting, Dr. Butes has contracted to research, build databases, write reports, and edit manuscripts for law firms educational agencies and others across the United States. She is now the American Indian Liaison for the Nebraska Department of Ed. And she's going to present on the Superintendent uh, Tribal Consultation Guide. So welcome, Dr. Butts. Thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I know it's difficult to say those, those words. Um, but uh, it's uh, the Bidwakan Tuan in Sioux, that's uh, a Spirit Lake community of people. Uh, it's one of the seven tribes of the Great Sioux Nation. Uh, and some say the original tribe. And uh, it's the Ihonk Tawan, that would be the Yankton where I'm enrolled. Okay, let me see if I can get this going. Slideshow from the beginning. There we go. Is that good? There we go. Uh, yes, I'm with the Department of Education, and what you guys are talking about really strikes home to almost everything that that I do. Um, <clears throat> from the curriculum to uh, mental health and behavioral health care for our children. Uh, there's so, ma so many things that need attention. And since 2016 or 14, uh, the Department of Education has uh, had a federal mandate to consult with the tribes that their students represent. And this has never happened. And our uh, commissioner has always been eager to build relationships with the tribes in Nebraska. And he's determined to make this a reality where the tribal communities have a seat at the table when the decisions are made. And for some of you, it's a, it's just uh, the, the, uh, it, it's simple, it, it, you do this, this is what, uh, what we do. At the, uh, the people in the rural districts near the reservation communities have the opportunity to, to meet with the tribal leadership and with the educational um, organizations there on the, on the reservation lands, the Omaha, the uh, Winnebago, Isanti, the Ponca. Um, and so they get to access the cultural knowledge that's available there in the communities people who are teaching language or storytelling or talking about uh, food sovereignty. It's much easier for those rural communities to have access to this information. And well, while the Ponca do have uh, offices in the urban areas, many schools just don't know how to get in touch with, with tribal communities. Uh, the urban districts in Nebraska uh, tend to have a lot more tribes uh, for example, in Lincoln and in Omaha, there are usually 50 or more tribes represented in the school districts. And while most of those people are um, probably expecting that they're the four tribes that are officed here in Nebraska, that's not necessarily true. Um, we have the... Um, the most heavily represented tribes are the uh, Omaha and the Ogallala. So we have the students from Pine Ridge and, and Omaha most heavily represented, but there are seven tribes that we are looking at to uh, begin our consultation with, because these are the students who are most heavily represented across the state of Nebraska. 
Now, I don't know how many of you know uh, how these reservations are set up. But when you look uh, here, you see this is a, the Omaha lands right here. And above that would be the Winnebago. They're together. And this uh, is the Santee. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm running it over the place. And then, of course, uh, the Yankton is on the other side of the river here. And the, the Rosebud is north. And then further west is the Pine Ridge. And it, it looks like our reservations are really small compared to these in South Dakota. And that's true, but it's really easy for these kids to jump across the border and go to school in Nebraska, which they do. So I've been making um, trips across the state to talk to the superintendents and the, the tribal representatives to see what they think and uh, how they believe these, this relationship could best be developed. Um, the United States Bureau of Indian Affairs publishes a, a list of recognized American Indian entities who are eligible, el, eligible to receive services. Uh, this list of federally recognized tribes uh, is available uh, on, at the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, website. If you just key in Bureau of Indian Affairs.gov, um, the list is updated, regularly updated and regularly published in the Federal Register. Right now, there are 574 tribes on this list, um, at, at, which is dated uh, January 28th, 22. The ne Nebraska Department of Education Guide for Tribal Consultation is uh, in a draft form right now. And uh, actually, all of the tribal communities and uh, many of the superintendents in Nebraska have this guide already, and I'm uh, hoping to get input from them to help uh, to make this easy and useful for anyone who uh, who might need it. Now, there there are funding opportunities for American Indians, and some of these funding opportunities require uh, tribal consultation. Some of them require uh, that the, mon the funds be spent specifically on American Indians, uh, while some of the others don't. Uh, they could be go to anyone. Um, now, I think it's, it's difficult for some people to, to think about asking a person for their uh, tribal ID, um, but you know it's it's required when you use. The, the Title VI funds for American Indians, those children must uh, be eligible to receive services with those dollars. The same is true for Johnson O'Malley. Uh, the the uh, Title VI uh, uh, tribal education agencies um, from, a, from an Indian tribe is authorized and has to be authorized by the tribe to administer the program or it can be a consortium of tribal education agencies in partnership with a state educational agency or a, a local education agency. Uh, they can apply for these funds as a, as a, in collaboration. And we have to uh, identify the, uh, the American Indian students who, who will be receiving services from these funds. The Johnson O'Malley program, uh, at least in the non-Indian areas of Nebraska, are much less uh, acquainted with the, with the program, the uh, Johnson O'Malley program, which is authorized by the Johnson O'Malley Act of 1934. Uh, it is fully explained in the uh, Code of Federal Regulations 25. Um, it, it authorizes contracts for the education of eligible American Indian students enrolled in public schools and previously private schools. The Johnson O'Malley Supplemental Indian Education Program Modernization Act um, became public law 115-404 on December 31st, 2018. And 
uh, the Johnson O'Malley programs offer American Indian and, and Alaska Native student programs such as culture, language, and academic support and, and dropout prevention. One of the things I've noticed as I go and talk to the people in, in the American Indian communities and how we might be able to work together comes down to language. The communities would really like to uh, have some support in um, reviving the languages. And it, it does make sense when you think about the boarding school experience when languages were pretty much stuffed, snuffed out for people. Um, I think all tribes were negatively affected by the boarding school um, process. They, they didn't allow the language, they didn't allow the um, ceremonial practices or uh, kinship organization was pretty much uh, destroyed too for a lot of tribes. So, you know, there are ways that I think the public schools in Nebraska can amend some of the harm done to, to the families uh, through education. Now, Title I is for the uh, schools that have a large number of uh, poverty, students who live in poverty. And while I know that we do have quite a bit of poverty, not all of our, our um, students fit, fit that category. There's also the uh, century 21, uh, this tw 21st century uh, community learning centers. Uh, they're formula grants and uh, the states get these to manage statewide competitions and award grants to eligible entities. So these are all ways that American Indian education can be funded. And like I said, some require um, the students to be American Indian and others don't. Um, the tribal consultation required by federal statute uh, began, oh, probably uh, 40 years ago, uh, they began to think about the ways that federal agencies impact uh, American Indian lands and American Indian communities. And so federal agencies who uh, engage in activities that affect American Indians, almost all of them now have um, a federal statute that requires them to um, consult with American Indian tribes. Uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act of 2018 updated this uh, requirement for tribes. Um, and this uh, the states, districts, and tribes must work together to strengthen education for American Indian students. Now, through my time at the universities uh, in various areas, I can tell you for a fact that no uh, U.S. history PhD was required to learn anything at all about American Indians, which is, it, it, to me, that's just unthinkable that you could get a PhD in U.S. history and still know nothing about American Indians. Um, so that's pretty basic. And, and, and that's true across the board. Uh, American Indians have been here since the beginning. And now it seems as if American Indian studies is segregated out into just another area, of almost like an elective, um, instead of uh, being a part of the what students learn. And I'd like to see that change. I'd like to see American Indian studies uh, included in everything, art, music. I mean, just think of what we've learned today and all of the ways that American Indian uh, perspectives can be woven into an education as important aspects of, of a child's lear learning. Um, now, there are some uh, parent meetings, parent uh, advisory, uh, but th those are, that's different from the representatives of Indian tribes in the state uh, to be included in this consultation that takes place, uh, that's supposed to take place. Um, and the states have to engage in timely and meaningful uh, stakeholder uh, consultation. And uh, 
not to make the decision and then tell the tribe, but to tell the tribe in enough time that the, the leadership has an opportunity to think it through and, and decide how they could be best served uh, through the educational process um, and, and develop a, a long range plan for their students. Um, federal funding through the, what the, we call this the easy uh, statutorily uh, requires uh, learning uh, local education agencies to consult with local tribes. Um, now, uh, local, ed, I mean, learning education agencies, local education agencies include school districts, charter schools, and tribal, tribal schools. Uh, but any uh, entity who receives easy money from federal government must consult with the tribes. Uh, if you have 50% or greater American Indian Alaska Native student enrollment, it statutorily requires LEAs to engage in tribal consultation. Uh, and receiving $40,000 or more in Title VI funding statutorily requires LEAs to engage in tribal consultation. So some, some of it is very clearly outlined. Um, and you have to wonder, uh, we have 272 school districts here in Nebraska. And why should we have a Nebraska Tribal Consultation Guide? Uh, well, each district is probably gonna uh, consult with more than one tribe. And the tribes will likely uh, be in a consulting relationship uh, with one, more than one district. American Indians are not a race of people. Uh, now, I, this, this makes it really difficult. I was at, uh, it was in uh, July, I believe, uh, I was at the National American Indian Education Advisory Committee meeting and the uh, National Indian Education data was, uh, was discussed. And one of the big, biggest problems we face is not knowing how to count American Indians. Uh, with the, the natives get thrown out uh, with more than one race or uh, if they are American Indian and a Hispanic, uh, they get put into the Hispanic uh, category. So almost every state um, has a problem with the counting American Indians. Um, when we know that Congress has, I, has uh, defined Indians throughout the the history of, of uh, our relationship with the federal government, uh, beginning with the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act, where they defined American Indians as one half uh, of blood of derived from a member of a federally recognized tribe. Um, and the, uh, the education also has all of these definitions. Uh, a descendant or a parent who meets the requirements described in uh, the first paragraph, which was being a member of a federally recognized tribe. Um, now this is what we use for Title VI, or considered by the Secretary of the Interior to be an Indian for any other purpose. Um, well, the uh, BIA uh, educational funds says that an American Indian with one quarter blood of a, uh, derived from a federally recognized tribe can receive uh, BIA funding for, for education. And so I guess that means if the person is not a member of a tribe, if they can um, document a one quarter blood from a federally recognized tribe, they would be eligible. Um, uh, and a member of an organized Indian group that received a grant under the Indian Education Act of 1988, as it was in effect on October 19, 1994. They get really specific with, with uh, who was an American Indian. In our state, uh, I believe there are actually 14 uh, educational service units, uh, but uh, Lincoln, is number 18 and uh, Omaha is number 19. 
because we have so many kids in our our service district. Uh, that's the way it looks. And I'm thinking, you know, one of the best ways might be for us to get together with the ESU administrators and talk to them uh, about the best way to help this, uh, the districts understand how to use the tribal consultation guide. Uh, here, these numbers are old, uh, but the blue, the blue stars are um, some of the school districts with the largest uh, American Indian student enrollment. The red stars are the, the uh, tribal school districts. And the yellow stars are the uh, out of, you know, they're outside the, the area. Here's one down here as well. These numbers are, are not uh, recent. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I guess that's really what I wanted you to know. And if you'd like to see the guide, I'd be happy to, to let you take a look at it and give me some feedback if, if you would. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Questions for, from anyone? Um, Barbara, do you want to share your contact information in the chat? That way people can uh, copy it if they want. And I have a question. Uh, are you doing any work on um, Indian education for all? Yes, yes, I am, uh, and I, I really believe in education, in, in education for all. And so I work with the curriculum specialists, and uh, trying to figure out uh, ways. And it, so far, I've worked with the art, music, uh, science, math, social studies, um, and reading. I think that's, oh, and CTE. Uh, because I do think it's it's really important for them to to uh, recognize that it, it, they don't have to change a thing. We can use the same uh, curriculum standards and uh, and include American Indians with almost every everything they do. Amy, can I make a comment? Yeah. This is Marion and Michelle. Yes, the Nebraska Indian Ed, we are moving towards that. Um, it's not that it's secret, but for certain reasons, we want to keep the work that we are doing a little bit under wraps right now. But uh, hopefully, I'm hoping as soon as uh, the er early November, we can let everybody know. But there are certain plans that we're putting in place first. And uh, we'll share that information as soon as we can, because we're gonna need all the support that we can throughout the state. So hopefully you with a lot of your democratic ties will also you know, be able to support that. But yeah, and we're looking at calling it indigenous education for all now. Oh, good. So that, you know, part of the way we're proposing it is that it can also be used for other ethnic groups sort of as like a template because, you know, because uh, Nebraska is becoming so diverse. So as soon as we can, we'll share it with everybody, but not quite yet. So, but thank you for asking that. Mm -hmm. What we've been working for the last six years. So, all right, thanks. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I uh, am uh, more uh, uh, inclined to say American Indian because uh, that's our, that's who we are. Um, and I worry about using indigenous uh, because there are some uh, ways that they count American Indians in the United States where the American Indian means North, South, Central American and not those treaty people um, or the, the uh, 
tribal, tri federally recognized tribes. So it's, I think, uh, and and I'm old, okay. <laughs> so I grew yeah, up an Indian. Um, yeah. and, and so uh, I encourage our students to look at American Indian as a as something to be proud of. This is where the, these are our treaties, um, and I'm uh, much opposed to being a victim because I uh, and I really loved the way that Tanea put it because um, we're survivors. Um, you now my grandmother, uh, born in 1866, died when I was 12 years old. And uh, she grew up in Minnesota, uh, hiding along the creek banks. Uh, there was a $200 bounty on Sioux scalps at that time. And, uh, and she survived. And she survived to see a man on the moon. She was uh, an amazing woman, uh, Ellen uh, Bluestone Ree. And she was... Uh, 1866 to 1962, and um, she saw a lot, and she was never bitter, or uh, and she loved everyone, and she taught us to be have a forgiving heart, and um, that nobody's better than a Sioux Indian. Uh, now, I'm not saying we're better than everybody else. I'm just saying that there's no one better than who we are and who you are, um, where, uh, and, and so I, I, I don't choose to oh, yeah. be any so, victimhood. That, that's what I mean, yeah. And, uh, and yeah. Uh, it's just, what, you know, the proposal that's on the table and it will be a group decision. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, I, you, just made, you just reminded me of it. That's all, Marion. I know, I, I love you. Is there any other comments or questions for Barbara? If not, we are at the end. Um, I want to thank you, Barbara, for your presentation and all the presenters today. Um, I did put a survey monkey link um, in the chat. If you could go in there, it's just five questions. Um, you know fill out, you know, if you have any comments or recommendations for future events, um, you can share that information now. Um, we do have thank you gifts for all of our presenters. We'll probably be reaching out for addresses and um, so we can send you our gratitude and thanks um, with, a, with a gift. Um, yeah, with that, we'll adjourn for today. And I want to, again, just say thank you um, for everyone that stuck it out all day. Um, thank you. And look forward to more events like this in the future. Okay. Thanks, Amy. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Amy, the one last thing is I'm teaching, so I've been back and forth all day, and, and I don't know, I, I've got your survey up, but it doesn't give me, a, you know, I, 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 I'm assuming everything was wonderful, but I, I can't really save for all these other wonderful presentations, and I don't want to pull your averages down. What would you recommend? Um, you could probably just maybe um, for the ones you did. I, I don't think it would, I mean, it'll tell me how many I think completed it. And then if you have any recommendations to just. So you don't, so if I have one where I didn't re say which, I didn't put a check yeah, mark on it. You have to answer it. Yeah. And I think it'll let you submit it. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for doing this. It's, it's, it, it's uh, oh my gosh. I don't know how to say it. Just thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of the week and life.
Never Thank onward. Bye bye. That's fabulous. Can we save the chat because there's some um, like personal emails and things for to? Yeah, Chris, can we do that? Chris is my tech guy. That great. Are you? Is, are you going to post this anywhere, like uh, educational material and stuff? Yeah, it'll probably, I'm thinking, be on the tribe's YouTube page, Winnebago Tribe. We did record it. Um, Great. So it'll yeah, be there are some um, for those that um, didn't get to it or would be contact information that some of the um, presenters gave and and then some answered, and I wasn't able to read what they wrote, you know, because of the presentations and. Yeah. I'd really love to be able to go back and get into that. Is it too late to write a message to somebody onto it now that the that it's ended or it's still live if you want to go ahead. Okay. So any ch any chats will be saved as well in the recording. Okay. Oh, awesome. Then awesome. And so maybe okay. if we could, if we had a class or something that we could schedule the class to see these presentations like a couple months from now. Right, Chris, will that will be where it be accessible at the YouTube channel? Um, it'll be a, 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 a movie file and but that way we could upload it to uh, our um, Winnebago Tribe YouTube channel. Cool, it could, how would you, how would I request that? Once we upload it, we'll give you, uh, we'll send over to Amy the link for it, then she can pass it out. Terrific. Thank you. Amy, you don't mind that, I hope. No. no. Okay. <laughs> Bless your heart. Okay. So, well, wow. This could be, uh, I just feel so good about some of the things that are happening. So thank you for that. Have a great day and rest. Of, you know, I guess you all go do something nice for yourselves. You too, Chris. Thank Ever you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <That's nice. laughs> nice. so, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, so again, how would I just, could I just get the chat without going through the entire presentation, base presentation or? Unfortunately, it is tied to the video, so. I'll so, see if I can try to break it out some way or another to have it separated if if that's possible. That would be awesome if you could. Um, but um, yeah, so I mean, I'm with Indigenous Roots. I'm I'm a professor with Indigenous Roots. I I teach all the math classes, the two content and the method. So several of these presenters were former students of mine and. It's just so awesome to see how they've grown in their, their, I mean, they were excellent students to begin with, obviously, but then to see them as these fantastic professionals and what they're contributing is just amazing, just wonderful. So anyway, it, 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 was a, it was great. I enjoyed every minute of every presenter and, uh, so, so thankful that we have been a part of it. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have to go. Bye. Yeah, thank you, Chris, too, for spending your day off with. Well, it's was, been my it's been my pleasure. I was wondering if you can save the chat by just clicking on those little dots down there at the bottom, and it says "Save Chat" underneath the chat. Oh. I think Sherry, you could do that. Let me see. So if I click on chat. No, save. Yeah, you have to have the chat room open. Okay, I do. And then there's three little dots down at the right. Oh, okay. Click on those little dots. And I think you can save the chat. Like the entire chat? The entire chat. It saves it. Ooh. Yeah, the top one, there is that option. You're... Okay, so save chat and that'll just save the whole string of chat. Save somewhere on your computer. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know where. And where it's floating around. Uh, yeah, that'll be another thing. Zoom, maybe just in. Um, yeah, you you'll get it if you if you saved it, you'll find it. Okay. All right. Well, I'll give that a try and. Uh, 
got to do it when it's open. When it's closed, you can't save it. And yeah. then once you save it there, it says show and folder. And then I will show you where it's saved at. Well, that's right. It says show and finder. Yeah. Uh, I've got save chat. And then when I clicked on that, which I did, it just says merge to meeting window. Oh, hopefully I you didn't got it. If I ended up with it, I'll send oh, it to okay. you. Okay, show Oops. and folder. Looks like the default is underneath documents. Okay, it disappeared. I'm sorry, you guys are ready to call it a day and I'm yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Save chat, show and folder, click. I don't know where, oh, it might come under, oh yeah. It comes under the category of Zoom in my folder so anyway well if you've got so you've got it saved or I, um, I think i maybe do and i have it saved as well i i can forward that on as well yeah one of us can get it to you okay now it's showing right. my i think chris's is probably going to be better than me i'm like i even hesitated to share this information <laughs> Sometimes I feel like roadkill on the information highway. Yeah, yeah. Duh. Brain dead, but I appreciate everybody's help and thank you for letting me be a part of this fabulous day. Yeah. It okay. was Amy. My own, Amy. so maybe it saved it. Yeah. In documents. I it probably did. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. One, well, I see it here. You'll you find it. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> if I lose it, I'll I'll try to get a hold of you. Chris is yeah. going. I don't want to hear from this woman ever again. <laughs> All right. That's all good. <laughs> Thanks, guys. What a day. All right. Bye for now. Bye. All right. Thank you, everyone. I will talk to you soon. Hey, Amy. I'll talk to you soon. Hey, I, I was wondering, I had proposed this for our Spencer project. Uh -huh. If we got some of the folks together from here um, that presented in, in January to just have a kind of a focus group uh -huh. that followed up on, on your evaluations. Okay. Yeah. And so I'll touch base with you about it, but I was thinking that might be a good way we could follow up. Okay. Yeah. And, this, and then also give us feedback because I know Spencer, we're gonna is gonna be part of the. We just, yeah. You want to share the results for that? Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Okay. But also maybe some kind of a focus group after this, after you get those results. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Darla, thankfully she. Did you do a uh, evaluation? I was like, oh my gosh, I was typing one up real quick. <laughs> were you? I, I, Darla and I were on the same wavelength because I was thinking that too. And yeah, so so I did is I, she, yeah. She thought about it and then, yeah, I just you, haven't been feeling real good the last couple of days. So. Oh no. Oh no. But we got through it. That's. that's oh, I just want to go <laughs> high five. High five. Yeah. Way to go. <laughs> That's all I want to do. I made it through. The, tonight, it's, it's um, so at the LEAD Center, the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs has that big award ceremony for Wes Studi. Oh, wow. Actor at the LEAD Center. And I'm like, I, Judy kept saying, aren't you going to come? You work at the LEAD Center. And I'm like, I don't think I'll be able to. I don't. I, I feel like I might not be able to come. But anyway, I think it all turned out. It it turned out as best it could. Yeah. Yeah. For real. Yeah. Well, we'll talk later. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna head yeah. home later. Okay. That's what I feel like doing. Taking a nap. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Thanks again, Chris. We'll talk to you later. No problem. Bye. Bye.